This was invented in 1895 by Talbert Lanston, who also invented an early type of calculator. These machines were used mainly for composing type for books. Um, this is a, a monotype keyboard, and it's, uh, it's part of a, a two-machine system. Uh, this in front of me is the keyboard, and allied to it is a casting machine. The keyboard sets the type and also punches a spool of paper. And the spool of paper is read eventually by the caster. I'll just give a quick demonstration of how a few lines of a book would be set. Now, I've set the first line in this copy and I've come to a comma and the next word is another and I've got that much space left I've got to decide whether I can fit that word in or not so I decide not to fit it in so therefore I've made a firm decision to end the line I now go to this justifying scale and I read the figures in the L-shaped device here. It reads 10 and 5. So I hit a top 10 in the justifying scale, 10 and a double 5 and I reverse. Now that I've set that line and it exists now in a series of punches on that paper. I'll just show you what happens when that goes to the caster. The larger punch is there, 10 and 5, will be read by the caster first. And they'll set wedges in position which will define the size of the space to bring the line out to the full measure. In other words, it, it will justify the line. The keyboard is, is powered by compressed air from a compressor outside, and you can hear it there. In its initial form, it had only one, one keyboard, and after a couple of years, that was extended to two sides, two, keyboard, two keyboards, as you see it there, with the different alphabets. Over a period of years, that was extended and improved upon so that you had more letters, uh, you, had, you were accommodated with uh, as many as 400 different characters. The original machines were quite limited. You might have, I think, there was only one set of uh, characters, one alphabet, or two alphabets at that time. That improved over the years. On the keyboard, I've got seven alphabets. I've got capitals of ordinary type, I've lowercase of ordinary type, and ordinary figures. I have the same thing, capitals, lowercase and figures in bold, heavy type. And I've the same thing again in italic, capitals of italic, lowercase of italic. And here, the seventh alphabet, I have small capitals. So I've everything I could possibly need as regards uh, setting the average job, or the average book, say, or the average pamphlet, or the average brochure, 
everything I could possibly need is there. I can also set languages. I can set all European languages. The accents can be put onto something that wouldn't be used for the specific work onto the small capitals. But I would have to get the, set, the right value. So in other words, if I had an accented A or an accented I, I must get the same value up here for the A or the I. Um, otherwise, I have to make up a measure before I start. Now, the measure I have there is 24 picas, 24 picas, and that converts to four inches in width. And it's the average measure that you will find in the average book. To start off, I hit a double set of justifying keys and reverse. And by doing that, if the caster was away from the machine, what I've done there will actually stop the machine. So it'll be the last thing to come out and it'll stop the machine if the, if the caster uh, man is not there. Those are the justification punches. Three and four. And they're the punches which decide on the space between the words. You can actually read the tape with this little chart here and I'll give you the numbers. Here I have a H6. So how do I identify those letters? I go to a printout of the die case which is there and I read the letters on top and the numbers down the side. So, for instance, if I want J2, I go J on top, two down here, and I have a square bracket. So that's how you actually can read the, the punches. Uh, I think the system worked for a full century. And within that century, it produced some of the best known and uh, best quality books ever produced. It's interesting to, to state also that um, the majority of the stock in the library would have been produced on the monotype system. Um, it, it went for uh, quality work and uh, whilst it was a two-man operation, the, the quality of the, of the print was exceptional. It wasn't only known for book work. It was also uh, the best system for doing table, tabular work. In other words, all types of timetables, transport timetables, uh, financial reports, all that sort of stuff, where you had a lot of columns. This was the machine for it. The linotype, in, in comparison, the two ran in tandem, really, in, in a lot of printing offices. The linotype uh, was a one-man operation, but didn't have the versatility of this. Also, the linotype produced slugs, complete line, whereas the monotype produced single characters. They were dip more difficult to handle for the compositor. Uh, you couldn't throw the type around and you couldn't, you, you had to be very careful and a lot of inexperienced compositors, um, their first experience with monotype was often a disaster uh, because the type would fall, could easily fall over. After uh, a bit of experience, you got to know how to handle it, and um, it was quite easy. Well, the keyboard operator, um, depending on his skills, he, he, 
he couldn't see really, he was working blind, he couldn't see what was being produced. Um, when you compare with, when you compare with uh, today's computers, um, you have a screen, you can see what you're doing. Here you couldn't. The only thing you, you knew was if you made a mistake, you were conscious of making the mistake. Now you, you, you had two options. You could continue and leave the mistake there, or you could kill the line. Um, and to kill the line, you only had to press, say you were, you only had to press a lower case justification button, the red buttons there, reverse. That killed the line. When the caster read that kill, kill punch, it stopped the machine and the paper moved on over where you had made the mistake. So a keyboard operator was, uh, he was judged on how accurate he was. And if you were accurate, you were highly thought of, you could command more money. Um, because people who made mistakes were holding up production. So it was very important to start off slowly when you were learning and build up your speed gradually. Because the relationship between caster and keyboard was so important, um, it was almost like a, a marriage. It was either good or bad. Um, if, if the keyboard operator gave trouble uh, or made a lot of mistakes in the setting, he created havoc on the caster. So uh, it was very important that the two people got on well together and they knew each other's strengths. Take off the spool. Then I write the instructions on the on the spool. And pass the spool now to the caster operator. 